what are you feeling in your body right now? Just maybe close your eyes, maybe open your rib cage a little bit, loosen, uh, relax your shoulders a little bit, and just see what what you're feeling in your body right at this moment. And now what I'd like you to do is uh, take what we might call uh, three centering breaths to just begin to notice how your breath enters your body. See if you can notice the path that it travels as it enters and exits your body. So just, again, maybe what we call soft eyes or closed eyes, three centering breaths. And what I want you to do next, we'll combine that breath awareness and body awareness. So experiment with me, if you will, and see if you can use your intention to direct your breath into different parts of your body. So first, again, soft eyes or closed eyes. As you inhale, direct your intention toward your toes. See if you can sort of send the breath to your toes. And then as you exhale, draw the breath up from your toes. Try that one more time. Now play with sending that intentionality into your hands, the tips of your fingers along your shoulders and arms. And then direct your awareness and your intention toward your spine. And see if you can draw the breath up along your spine up into the top of your head. Maybe try that a couple of times. And as we hold together this awareness of our breath and awareness of our bodies, I want us to think about uh, what we read in Genesis that when God breathed breath, neshama, into the human that God had formed, that's when the human became a nefesh, a living being. That breath of God animates life. The spirit of God is in you, energizing you, sustaining you, pairing itself with your intention within your body. Sally, did we have any announcements we need to make this morning? I just want to mention at the end. Because okay. Come in a little later. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we'll have announcements at the end. Um, note cards are making their way around. You, a number of you still have your note cards maybe from yesterday, and that is fine. Um, so they're just there if you want them. Um, reminder what these are for, question and insight and application, something that may be challenging you that comes up during the lecture. Um, so today our topic is grabbed by the hair and punched in the jaw. Prophetic encounter with an embodied God. It's not always comfortable to be in relationship with God. So our outline today, we're going to start uh, with some narratives in the historical books. And uh, we'll focus on some Elijah stories. We'll look at Saul's experience 
uh, we'll briefly consider the story of uh, the vision of Micaiah ben Imla and the spirit that stands in the heavenly court on that occasion. And from there, we're going to look at the commissioning narratives of our three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And we'll be focusing in each case on the embodied dimensions of prophetic encounter with God, prophetic experience um, in relation to God uh, in those narratives. So we start with a prophet in motion. You are in Samaria. There has been drought and famine, severe drought and famine, and now the drought and famine are about to end. The prophet Elijah receives instruction from the Lord to present himself to King Ahab. On the way, he encounters the king's palace manager, Obadiah. Obadiah has been sent out to search for water because everyone is thirsty and water cannot be found. Obadiah sees Elijah, recognizes him, and his first response is to fall on his face before the prophet. Obadiah reveres this servant of the Lord. But when Elijah asks Obadiah to please announce his presence to the king, Obadiah says, oh, no, no, no. Don't make me do that. Why does he initially refuse? Is it because he doesn't want to present Elijah to the king? I don't think so. He knows the king would be delighted with whoever brings in the person who is currently holding the top spot on the king's most wanted list. But Obadiah fully expects that he will report to the king that he has found this elusive prophet Elijah. He's been hiding out. And before the king has a chance to greet him or apprehend him, Elijah will have vanished. He says, as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you, I know not where. So when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, he will kill me. The spirit of the Lord will carry you, I don't know where. Scholar Richard Nelson refers to this statement by Obadiah as an expression of flustered fears. I don't think so. Obadiah is afraid but he's also courageous. It was Obadiah who hid 100 prophets of Yahweh in caves and provided them with food and water when his queen was hunting prophets to kill them. That took courage. Obadiah even now tells Elijah he'll do as Elijah has asked, even though he thinks it will cost him his life. It sounds to me like he's speaking from experience, from knowledge, that Elijah apparently has a habit of being supernaturally transported by the Spirit of God. Later in the same chapter, Elijah does speak with Ahab. And so we hope that Obadiah has been spared. After the famous showdown at Mount Carmel, Elijah announces to Ahab that the rain is coming. Elijah is here portrayed with superhuman sensory perception. He hears the sound of rushing rain before even a cloud is visible in the sky. When the king finally does see a cloud way far off on the horizon, Elijah instructs him to harness the horses, mount the chariot and ride down the mountain before the rain would prevent him from arriving at the plain of Jezreel over 20 miles away. And the king does ride. Heavy rain comes. And we are told that the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. He girded up his loins and he ran in front of Ahab in the chariot pulled by horses to the entrance of Jezreel. That's just a mile or two shy of a marathon. 
This is a picture of Yuki Kawauchi winning the 2018 Boston Marathon amid pouring rain. A horse-drawn chariot careens down a mountain. The driver, eager to avoid storm, wind, and rain, a royal chariot would boast horses that were strong, sure, and fast, probably the fastest in the country. And Elijah outpaces them because the hand of God impels him. The most famous instance of Elijah's supernatural transport occurs at the end of his earthly life. The Lord is planning, we are told, to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind. And in preparation for this event, Elijah and Elisha travel by foot from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho, retracing and reversing the path by which Joshua led Israel into the Promised Land. They also cross the Jordan. And then we are told a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind to heaven. This is pretty astonishing to me. But what I want to call your attention to is that for the 50 prophets who greet Elisha after Elijah's whirlwind ascension, this is not too far out of the ordinary where Elijah is concerned. They say to Elisha, we're pretty fit guys. Why don't we go look for him? We're thinking the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and thrown him down on some mountain or into some valley. For these 50 men, it did not challenge the imagination that a whirlwind would pick up the prophet Elijah, carry him somewhere else, and throw him down. It makes modern air travel sound like a pleasant experience. <laughs> this scenario takes Heidegger's geworfenheit, thrownness, to new levels. Elijah's possibly habitual, embodied experience as a prophet who gets transported by the Spirit of God willy-nilly is one of utter contingency. Compare the improbable circumstances of Elijah's meals. At God's command, he hides in a wadi to be fed by a conspiracy of ravens. And when I wondered what sort of food that might entail, I looked on Wikipedia to see what sorts of things did ravens collect in their food gathering ventures. It said they are extremely versatile and opportunistic in finding sources of nutrition, feeding on carrion, insects, cereal grains, berries, fruit, small animals, and food waste. That was one set of meals. At God's command, Elijah, was sent to petition food from a widow who barely had enough to prepare her own last meal and the last meal of her child. How improbable that they would be able to feed Elijah. And when he flees to the wilderness to die, an angel feeds him a meal that sustains him for 40 days of travel by foot, one meal. Elijah hides when he's told to hide, shows up when he's told to show up, eats when and what he is told to eat, and sometimes gets caught up in a whirlwind by the Spirit of God and taken God knows where. This embodied matrix of finitude and freedom is fundamental to Elijah's prophetic experience. And it is mediated to the prophet through the agency of animal and angel and the word, the spirit, and the hand of God. Now, we might assume that when biblical authors describe the mediation of the spirit or the hand of God, 
They didn't imagine bodily interaction between God and human in any literal material sense. The spirit is spiritual, right? That hand of God pushing Elijah ahead of the horses must have been a figure of speech, a way to say that Elijah was really on that day. Calvin construed the hand of God as divine power exercised through what he called an inward operation. Now, the ancient biblical writers did not typically reduce God's activity and existence to the boundedness and limitations of a single bodily form. They also understood that divine, that divine existence exceeded the bounds of human perception and understanding. Who can search out God's limits? But they believed in an embodied God who could interact with God's creation in ways both indirectly and directly material. And as we consider some examples, I'll share with you a comment from one of your colleagues who said, interested in conversation, practice, and scholarship on embodied understanding of God that does not perpetuate dualistic and ultimately reductionistic ideas of God. How, in a contemporary context, can we understand God as embodied in a way that is expansive and outside the box? Outside the box. So, by the way, if you hand in your note cards, you too can be featured in a convocation lecture. <laughs> Let's look at these examples for some ideas. Genesis 2 and 3 portray gods forming a human from clay and breathing breath into the human's nostrils. In chapter 2, verse 7, performing surgery and building yet another human, walking noisily in the garden. making leather garments for Adam and Eve. We're told in chapter 8 that God smelled the pleasing odor of Noah's offering. And if you think about it for a moment, Israel's ritual offerings of incense and animal sacrifice gambled that God would notice and delight in their pleasing smell. The language of biblical prayer is not always strictly metaphorical, but presumes that God can see and hear and speak. The psalmist pray, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Bend your ear, O God. We have heard the words of your mouth. In some cases, the scriptures portray God's body as similar to a human's. Three beings visit Abraham and Sarah at their tent and dine with them. They eat a meal. They are called in that narrative men, Anashim. One of them is also called the Lord in verses, uh, chapter 18, verses 2, 13, and 22. Jacob wrestles by the Wadi Yabuk with a powerful being who is called a man in verses, uh, chapter 32, verses 24 to 25, and is called God in verses 28 and 30. And Jacob leaves that encounter limping, carrying in his own body the memory and the testimony to his struggle with an incarnate deity. At other times, the divine body is luminous, gigantic, hidden, or ineffable. Frequently, humans encounter a mediating emanation, a hypostasis, or what we might think of as a semi-divine representative of God. Angels, men, 
other manifestations could mediate divine presence and agency in a bodily form that was often easier for a human to perceive, to comprehend, and to interact with. And if we, if we really want something to puzzle on and a way to connect some of these dots, recognize that the prophet is also called to mediate in that same way. The hand and breath or spirit of God could similarly stand in for, mediate, and make present the agency and power of God's whole self. God's whole self. So let's pause for a moment with the spirit of God. This is a theologically loaded phrase we inherit a robust Trinitarian framework for understanding the Spirit's identity and activity. That framework helpfully shapes our understandings of the fullness of meaning of Spirit, or Ruach, as it is in Hebrew in the Old Testament. Sometimes it can also limit our grasp of its meanings in ancient contexts by importing later, narrower, or simply different frames of meaning. So I want us to be sensitive to what may be the distinctive inflections associated with ruach, spirit, breath, in the Old Testament scriptures. We might, for example, follow the lead of New Testament Greek, making such a sharp distinction between pneuma, spirit, on the one hand, and soma and sarx, body and flesh, on the other, that we would imagine spirit to be the opposite of something material, perceptible, or embodied. But the Hebrew word that we translate spirit, this word ruach, literally means wind or breath. Wind or breath. Wind and breath, usually not visible but they are not therefore immaterial or imperceptible. When I looked up a definition of wind, it was given as the perceptible movement of air. We know it is wind because we feel it on our skin, in our follicles, even in our bones. Breath is also a movement of air. Take a moment, indulge me, if you will, and breathe on your hand. A little bit moist, warm. If you ever wonder why you weigh less when you wake up in the morning than you did before you went to bed, that weight exits your body. Some of it's sweat, but they say most of it exits your body in your breath. Your breath includes water, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, argon, and more. Breath is a materially necessary component of animal life. For humans, breath is the difference between a body and a corpse. Biblical and other early Jewish literature frequently personified ruchot, that's the plural form of ruach, personified ruchot, winds and spirits, as members of God's heavenly court who were active also on earth. And though they were not bound by the kind of fixed body with cell walls and a container of skin such as you or I have, they could materially interact with and enter into human bodies. They could thus act on earth as dynamic physical proxies for God. When Samuel meets the young Saul, he predicts that Saul will meet a band of prophets who are playing harp and tambourine and flute and liar, and they will be prophesying. The verb that's used, mit, nabaim, 
Uh, if you see that uh, up on the, the second line here, you'll see it has the, the root of the word Navi, prophet, in it. It's a hit pile, sort of reflexive or iterative form. And uh, different, different translations render it different ways. So hit pile often means something kind of intensive. And so NRSV says they were in a prophetic frenzy. And CEB says they were caught up in a prophetic frenzy. NAB says they were in a prophetic state. We're, we're not quite sure if it reached the level of frenzy, but they were in a state. And, um, and NABRE, uh, they revised it to prophetic ecstasy. Okay, so folks are, you know, maybe a little conflicted about what was what was happening there, but it's but it's outside of ordinary experience. And at that moment, Samuel predicts the spirit of the Lord will rush upon Saul and will cause Saul also to prophesy using this same uh, hit pile verbal form, and he will be turned. The verb here uh, means literally flipped over. He's going to be he's going to be turned inside out, nepakta, into another man. And as predicted, Saul meets the prophets and the spirit rushes upon him, transforming his consciousness, his speech, his actions, and inciting a proverb among Saul's uh, um, among the the people of Judea about Saul's possible inclusion among the prophets. Is Saul also among the prophets? those frenzied people, that proverb will be repeated in a later episode in 1 Samuel 19, 20 to 24, at a time now when Saul is hunting David to kill him, the spirit gets a little creative because through the spirit's intervention in this particular episode, Saul ends up knocked out for about 24 hours, and David is able to get away. So we see the spirit kind of has an agenda here. But what happens is the spirit of God, again, induces in Saul a prophetic state, this time in the company of a group of prophets led by Samuel. And under its influence, Saul, we are told, stripped off his clothes, prophesied before Samuel, and fell naked for that entire day and night. A later narrative portrays a spirit in heaven before it becomes active among prophets on earth. In a vision of Micaiah ben Imla, a spirit stands up, stands up before the Lord and speaks in the divine assembly and volunteers to enter the mouths of the court prophets in order to deceive the king. A question arises, is it only in the historical books of Samuel and Kings that the hand of God impels a prophet to extraordinary physical feats, or the spirit transports a prophet bodily, or rushes upon a man and causes him to enter a prophetic frenzy and take off his clothes and prophesy and lie down for a day? Maybe it's just these narratives and maybe we shouldn't take them as paradigmatic of prophetic experience. So let's test that out. And let's see what we find when we turn to the latter prophets. And we're going to take as our examples Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Oh, sorry. This was partly that first line. It's from what I just said. OK. Um, we're going to see that these actions attributed to the hand and spirit of God have parallels in the experiences of the major prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And I chose these because these are the books where we have the, the greatest amount of narrative uh, to get uh, take that dive into prophetic experience. So we're going to give particular attention to the commissioning narratives of these prophets. And as we examine these prophetic commissioning narratives, we'll reflect on the meaning of the prophet's embodied experience in relation to their vocation and their mission. 
we're going to see that Isaiah's commissioning narrative is especially rich in its projection of a physical environment with a wide array of sensory stimuli, including movement, vibration, emotion, and touch. Isaiah's mission holds a corresponding sensory complexity, and that's putting it mildly, intertwining sensory perception, cognition, and bodily wellness. Jeremiah's commissioning narrative provides less detail about the exterior physical setting, but delves inside the body of the prophet and the womb of the woman who bore him. And in a jarring physical encounter, God strikes Jeremiah on the mouth, placing God's words within it mapping the provenance of Jeremiah's future prophetic speech from God's body to the prophets. And this painful commissioning marks the beginning of a prophetic ministry that will be wracked with suffering and lament for a people who must learn to confront their own mortal wound. For Ezekiel, the word and spirit and hand of God are heavy on him. Divine words do not just enter his mouth. He eats them and assimilates them into his body. His body is then transformed and restrained, hardening him into a witness and an accuser who will set his face against nations and his own people. Isaiah. Scholar Benjamin Summer has some wonderful wor work in a book called um, The Bodies of God and the World of Ancient Israel. If that's a topic that interests you, I strongly recommend it. In his analysis of divine embodiment in the Hebrew scriptures, he defines a body very simply. It doesn't get to everything that we would want to say about what is a body, but it has some interesting insights that a body is something located in a particular place at a particular time, whatever its shape and substance. Isaiah's commissioning narrative locates the bodies of prophet and God together in one time and one place. The time is after the death of a Judahite king, Uzziah, the place is in Yahweh's temple in Jerusalem. Uzziah's death evokes a contrast between the now inert body of the deceased human king and the vital energy emanating from the divine glory. The temple setting evokes a history of relationship that includes the election of people and place, and it includes the worship of Yahweh through rituals of procession, song, and sacrifice. These and the details that follow supply to the audience of this narrative a framework for imagining, recreating, and participating in this encounter between prophet and God. We'll be talking more about that on Thursday. What's happening in the audience when we are given these details as, as food for our own sensory perception? So the second set of details is sensory. Isaiah's visual experience encompasses the posture, size, height and clothing of the deity. Clothing of the deity, how remarkable is that? God is portrayed as stationary, exhibiting a posture of authority, stability, and sovereignty. Two participles are given high and lifted up that describe God's position 
relative to the prophet and to the rest of the scene. Vertical height in the scriptures is associated with power and strength, honor, triumph, and rule. And it further suggests great size, a possibility that is confirmed by the description of Yahweh's garment when we're told that the robe is so vast that its, its edge, its hem, fills the temple. The great size of the deity creates an impression of smallness in the beholder increasing the awareness of contingency and finitude that was evoked by those references, that reference to Uzziah's death. And this stationary deity contrasts with the seraphim. Isaiah sees them. They are flaming serpents who are portrayed as standing, but their standing is not like the standing of you or me. When I stand, I try at least to, to stay in one place. Uh, when they stand, they are flying. They are flying. So this dynamic interplay between, uh, between this stationary and, uh, and um, activity of movement is meant to be paradoxical. They are paradox embodied. The prophet perceives their bodily form through simultaneous concealment and movement. We're told with two wings they cover their faces, with two wings they cover their feet, and with two wings they fly. Their role is to be guardians and mediators of sacred power, and that role is emphasized by their physical form that defies human approach. Would you go near a flaming serpent that can fly? I wouldn't uh, try to touch that. Um, defies human approach and combines categories of the created order. If you think back to Leviticus, there's all this emphasis on, you know, everything in its category, and you don't eat the animals that combine the categories. Um, and we learn that when something, uh, when something combines those categories, it is either profane or it is very, very sacred. Uh, this hybrid form makes them a guardian of the sacred. The next detail is auditory. But this quickly expands to include a multitude of senses. Isaiah hears the speech of the seraphim. It's described as the voice of the one who was calling. Paradox, again. There were many seraphim, the voice of the one. This sound causes the very architecture of the temple to begin to shake, to fill with smoke. Smoke is elsewhere a hallmark of divine theophany and combines with quaking to describe God's descending from heaven within God's temple. Consider then how smoke, sound, shaking, how do these affect the prophet's body? Let's go there for a moment. Sensations that are not only auditory, but entail for the prophet. Movement, maybe loss of balance, constriction of airways. Was it suddenly hard for the prophet to breathe? Hard to see through all the smoke? What was he smelling? What was he tasting in his mouth at this moment of theophany? The words of the seraphim, you know them well. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies. The fullness of all the earth is Yahweh's glory. These words draw attention to the absolute otherness, the absolute otherness of God. This God who sits upon a throne above the tiny prophet. They call attention to the great extent of divine glory in relation to the inhabited world. 
And while the precise meaning of glory, that word, um, sorry, I should have put it on the slide. Many of you will be familiar with it, kavod, this word for glory. It comes from a root that, that means something is heavy. Something is heavy. And notice, you know, put your, your uh, materiality lenses on and just uh, think about what it means that the glory of God shares a root with something that refers to the weight of matter. Um, and yet it can have different meanings. So we want to be sensitive to that range of meanings that this word glory has. Uh, ben Summer notes that its range of meanings includes body. Glory can just mean body. It can mean substance. When applied to God, it can variously refer to this exceptionally bright and massive divine body I've referred to a few times. Uh, it can be a quality of God that Summer says embodies God's presence but does not exhaust it. Or it can refer to a kind of abstract characteristic, such as the honor that is due to the deity. And when we look at the use of the term in this context, with all of the sensory details that are provided and this description of God sitting on the throne, visible to the eye of the prophet, it seems that God's glory here refers to a perceptible physical manifestation of God's divine being. Isaiah responds to this multi-sensory manifestation of God and seraphim by drawing attention to what he believes to be the inadequacies of his own body and the inadequacies of the bodies of his people. He says, woe to me, I have been cut off, for I am a man of impure lips amid a people of impure lips. For the king, Yahweh of hosts, have my eyes seen. And I couldn't really get it in good English, but in the Hebrew, eyes is the last word in this verse. And, and so you have both lips and eyes in what we would call an emphatic final position and in a parallel position to each other. And what that evokes for us is a contrast, the perceived contrast between what Isaiah has seen, this vision of glory, and what Isaiah regards as the state of his own body. That contradiction that Isaiah feels will be resolved through unsolicited physical contact. A seraph grasps a pair of tongs with them, picks up a burning coal from the altar and presses it to the prophet's mouth. The verb for the seraph's touch, you have it up here, it's naga, can mean to touch or to strike. We're going to see it again in Jeremiah's commissioning narrative. To give you a sense of how that verb is used elsewhere in the book of Isaiah, because I kind of wonder, like, well, what kind of touch? was that. We see this verb used in Isaiah 53, 4 in one of the servant poems, what is perhaps the most well-known servant poem, and it says, we accounted him as Nagua, katul, passive, participle from Naga, translated by the NRSV, stricken by NJPS, plagued, uh, the Septuagint, uh, kind of thinks forward to how did it feel and translates, and Pano, in pain. We regarded him as in pain. That is the, the verb that is used here. And with this touch or strike or brand with a burning coal, the blazing serpent, serpent brands the mouth of the prophet with, just think about this for a moment, this lumpen object that has been excavated from the earth, and let us say the body of the earth, and ignited for worship. Think about what is entailed even just in that object of the coal in terms of capacity for transformation, for, um, for ignition, Isaiah's next sensation is auditory. 
he hears the voice of God request a candidate for mission, and his speech is now emboldened by his purification that has been effected by that touch of coal. He immediately volunteers and he receives his mandate. And just as Jer Isaiah's encounter with God emphasized paradoxical sensory perception, so does his commission. Two emphatic infinitive absolutes, if you took Hebrew, this will be somewhat familiar. We have these forms, shimu, shamoa, uru, uru, uru rao, hearing, like really, really, really hearing and really, really, really seeing, that kind of emphasis. They highlight the actions of seeing and hearing without knowledge, without knowledge. And Isaiah is told to fatten the people's hearts and weigh down, make heavy their ears, and gum up their eyes so they cannot open them, so they cannot perceive, they cannot see, they cannot hear, they cannot understand. Because if they do see and hear and understand with their heart this organ of discernment, they will turn. You all uh, are familiar with this word, to turn. It occurs so often in the Old Testament scriptures, shuv. And often you'll see shuv translated repent. And it makes us think of someone down on their knees. But what the word means in Hebrew is literally to physically turn. And when you turn like that, this 180 degree reorientation, you're facing in a different direction. And what God was always asking the people to do through the prophets was to turn to God, turn and face, orient themselves to God. So if they perceived, if you hear a noise, you turn toward it. If you catch something out of the corner of your eye and you want to know what it is, you turn toward it. If your heart latches on to something, you turn toward it. If they could perceive in their bodies, they would turn toward God. And if they turn, God said, it would heal for them. Raphalo, in the Greek, we have this first person statement where God says, Yasomaiotus, I would heal them. I would heal them. So in this passage, the faculties of eye and ear and heart are more than metaphors for the cognitive work of perceiving and understanding. They were understood as organs that mediate knowledge and facilitate encounter and relationship. Where we might speak of mind or brain, the people of Israel cherished the beating heart as the seat of intellect, memory, and will. In the same way, the promise of healing names bodily restoration not as a metaphor, a familiar thing signifying a less familiar thing, but as a metonym, part for the whole. Bodily restoration of God's people was part and parcel of their restored relationship with God. The purification of Isaiah's mouth similarly could stand for the eventual purification of the people because he belonged to that people. Jeremiah. Now, like Isaiah's temple vision, Jeremiah's commissioning also emphasizes time and space, but it begins with a flashback that replaces the temple's quaking pillars with the fleshy walls of a womb, and a king's death with the gestation of new life. Meiosis, gastrulation, embryogenesis, Growth and differentiation of fetal tissues are the embodied temporal boundary that God chooses to mark God's relationship with Jeremiah and the prophet's consecration. Could you pick a more embodied temporal marker? God's role as the one who formed the prophet in the womb, that verb at sorka comes from the verb yatsar, 
to form like forming clay, Yotzer, the potter. This echoes the shaping of the first human in Genesis 2-7, imaging God as potter, as in Jeremiah 18-11, who molds clay, molds life like clay in God's hands. And that image evokes simultaneously intimacy, protection, and nurture alongside divine creativity. After reminding Jeremiah of this intimate beginning, we're told that the Lord sent the Lord's hand and touched or struck against my mouth. As previously with Isaiah, so here the nature of this touch is ambiguous, but clues from elsewhere in scripture may illuminate its force here because we have an interesting pairing of phrases. There are two other biblical verses that pair the action of sending God's hand and touching or striking. Job 1.11 and 2.5. In these passages, the Satan is speaking, and the Satan cajoles God. Send your hand and touch or strike all that Job has. Later, send your hand and touch or strike his bone and his flesh. When a great wind or spirit or breath later touches the house that sheltered Job's children and causes their deaths, the translators of NRSV and NJPS choose struck rather than touched. NAB renders the verb smashed. And later Job would say to his friends, pity me, pity me, you my friends, because God's hand touched or struck me. Another figure well known for contending with God was also touched, using this verb naga. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he, NRSV translation, struck him on the hip socket. And Jacob's hip was dislocated from its joint. Jeremiah's relationship with God in the book that bears his name has close similarities with the wrestlings of Jacob and the railing lament of Job. Jeremiah will later accuse God of seducing, overpowering, and prevailing over him. It is not a stretch then to imagine that God's touch was not so much a tender caress as a punch in the jaw. Like Job's lost children and health or Jacob's limp, this touch may well have left its scar on the prophet's body. With this touch, God placed God's words in the prophet's mouth, appointing him destroyer, uprooter, and overthrower, also builder and planter, from the site of his own injury. Jeremiah would help God's people to acknowledge the wound they preferred to ignore. For Jeremiah, the word of the Lord that he was commissioned to prophesy, violence and destruction, he says, brought him constant disgrace and contempt. But if he refrained, he says, it was in my heart like a raging fire shut up in my bones and I grew weary holding it in and I could not. Even as the word burst the bonds of the prophet's heart and bones, so the tears of the prophet would incite the tears of God at a moment when the lament of prophet and God have merged into one, Jeremiah cries out, who will turn my head into water and my eyes into a fountain of tears? Then I would weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Tears do yield finally to consolation 
and to the possibility that the people's wound may be healed. Ezekiel. Ezekiel's prophetic experiences directly pair word and body. As the book opens, we are told that the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the son of Buzi, the priest, and the hand of the Lord came upon him. These are in parallel. The word of the Lord came, the hand of the Lord came upon him. Divine word and hand here enclose and surround the prophet, their parallelism suggesting a dynamic interrelationship between divine efficacious speech, embodied agency, and the person of the prophet. The first arrival of word and hand unfolds the famous chariot vision. In the commission that follows, a voice directs Ezekiel to stand and a spirit enters into him and sets him on his feet. The prophet's own bodily obedience and posture of readiness is animated and effected by divine breath. The voice commands, open your mouth and eat what I give to you. Ezekiel narrates, I looked and a hand was stretched out to me, and a written scroll was in it. He spread it before me. It had writing on it, on the front and the back. Written on it were words of lamentation and mourning and woe. He said to me, mortal, eat what is offered to you. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So. I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. He said to me, mortal, eat this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Not just that little bit you tore off the bottom, the whole thing. And then I ate it, and in my mouth it was as sweet as honey. He said to me, mortal, go to the house of Israel and speak my very words to them. See I have made your face hard against their faces and your forehead hard against their foreheads. Like the hardest stone, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. And then Ezekiel says, the spirit lifted me up. And as the glory of the Lord rose from its place, the spirit lifted me up and bore me away. I went in bitterness and in the heat of my spirit, the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. In this commission, Ezekiel ingests the prophetic word, incorporating it, becoming filled with it. And when he does so, his body is transformed and hardened for his ministry to match the stubbornness of the people to whom he must prophesy, and he experiences that whirlwind travel as bitter and painful physical compulsion. The animating force of the spirit links the body of the prophet to the body of the people. He is their first fruit as much as he is their watchman, undergoing in his own body transformations and translocations that will make possible the transformation of God's people. And we'll stop there.